OTT stick can receive DCC commands and communicate with LocoNet via interface or Wi-Fi and MQTT. But what can it actually do with that information? Well, that depends on the function head that is connected on the right side of the IOTT stick. In this video, I am showing you what you can do with the blue hat signaling device. Welcome to the IOTT channel. I am Hans Tanner. Here is a list of the key features of the blue hat. It is connected to IOTT stick via the head connector. The output pigtail connects to a three wire LED chain using the typical JST connector. An optional 6 to 12 volt DC power jack can be used to supply up to 3 amps to the LED chain and provide 5 volts to the IOTT stick. Alternatively, a small number of LEDs can be driven from the IOTT stick without using an external power supply. The maximum LED chain length is only limited by the memory of the IOTT stick. More than 1000 LEDs can be connected. The typical LED chain refresh rate is 20 Hz. All the LEDs are programmable to display block detector status, turnout position, signal aspects, layout power status, button activity and analog inputs. The LED colors and display modes like static or blinking can be configured individually for each LED. A fully programmable onboard LED number 0 allows for testing LED settings. Let's first have a look at the hardware and then see how the LEDs are configured to show what you want. The blue hat device measures about 60 x 25 x 19 mm. On the stick side it has an 8 pin single inline connector that connects to the head interface of the IOTT stick. On the layout side it has a 3 wire pigtail that connects to a standard 5 volt LED chain with WS 2812 NeoPixels. On top of it is a power jack to connect the standard power supply between 6 and 12 volts and up to 3 amps. Using this is optional though. If you only connect a limited number of LEDs, they can be supplied with power via the USB connector of the stick. How many LEDs you can operate that way depends on the total power consumption, which is a function of the brightness. On my test layout I use 16 signals with a total of 20 LEDs and the chain is powered just from the stick using an old USB phone charger. On the other hand, if you do use the power input of the blue hat, you do not need to connect the USB port of the stick. It will automatically receive power from the blue hat. Inside the blue hat we find two PC boards. The base board has all the connectivity elements and the onboard LED. On top of it is the 3 amp buck converter with adjustable output voltage, which is set to 5 volts. Do not change the output voltage to something significantly higher than 5 volts, as this voltage is used to supply the IoTT stick. Therefore, too high values may cause damage to the stick itself. The schematic is really simple. The blue hat is powered with 5 volts from the stick via pins 7 and 8 of the single inline connector. Pin 6 carries the data signal for the WS2812 LED chain and drives the onboard LED. Pin 6 comes from GPIO26 of the ESP32, so that is the data output pin for the blue hat. If you connect the power supply, the voltage is fed into the buck converter and the resulting 5 volts are then used to power the LED chain and the IoTT stick via pin 1. The onboard LED serves two different purposes. First, it can be used to verify the functionality of the device without connecting an actual LED chain. Logically, it simply is LED number 0 of the entire LED chain, and it can be programmed as any other LED in the chain. In fact, as shipped, it is configured as a 4 aspect signal that can be controlled with switch addresses 1 and 2. So, you can connect the blue hat to an IoTT stick, select your communication interface and select the blue hat module. You now can control LED 0 from your throttle. Switch 1 thrown makes it red, switch 1 closed turns it to yellow, switch 2 thrown makes it blink and switch 2 closed gives you a green light. 
and very conveniently the enclosure of the blue hat has a small opening so that you always can see what LED number zero is doing. The second purpose is technical. It brings the signal voltage of the data signal from the 3.3 volt data output of the ESP32 to a 5 volt level. This makes it possible to operate 12 volt NeoPixel chains. To do so, you connect ground and data out of the blue hat to the 12 volt chain and use a separate 12 volt power supply for the supply voltage. Watch video number 26 for more information on this topic. Let's now have a closer look how the LEDs can be configured. All configuration of the LED chain is done using the web interface. Click the LED chain setup tab that appears as soon as the blue hat module is selected. The first part of the page lets you configure the LED chain's basic settings. The first entry allows you to change the sequence how colors for each pixel are transmitted. In each transmission, each pixel receives three values to set the brightness of the red, green and blue LED. Unfortunately, not all LED chains speak the same language here. Some take the first value to set the green LED, others use it for red and so on. So if you select an LED to be red and in reality it shows green, you probably can fix it by changing the color sequence from RGB to GRB. Technically, any sequence is possible, but so far I only have seen RGB and GRB. So I only provided these two options. And yes, if you join two chains with different color models, there is no way to fix it in the setup. One of the chains will always be wrong. The next field is the number of LEDs in the chain. Remember that LED number zero is the one on the board. So if you connect say 250 LEDs, make this 251 or you will not be able to control the last LED in your chain. Maybe you wonder what the maximum number of LEDs might be. So do I. I know that 1000 is not a problem. The maximum I ever have configured is 4500, but I have not physically connected them. So right now the maximum chain length is not determined, but probably more than you will need. The system blink period entry sets the blink frequency for the global blink bit in milliseconds. If you set it to 500, LEDs using the setting will blink 500 milliseconds on, 500 milliseconds off. The second line is used to control the brightness of the entire LED chain. The first entry defines how to control it. Right now, the only option is analog, meaning the chain watches for analog values on the address specified in the next field and adjusts the brightness to that value. Check video number 31 to see a working example. The initial level field allows you to set the brightness at startup. A value of 1 means full brightness. 0.5 is about half. Normally 50% is just about right for most situations as the LEDs are pretty bright anyway. The second part of the configuration screen lets you specify LED colors you want to use. Give each color a unique name so you can later select it from a drop down list. Click the colored rectangle to bring up the color dialog that lets you define the color assigned to that name. Note that the colors on the screen are not exactly the same what you get from the LED, so you may want to experiment a little bit. The good news is that you can always go back and change the color later, and all LEDs with that color assigned to it will change accordingly. The navigation elements to the right can be used to create a new color entry, delete the current line, or move a specific line up or down. These symbols are used in various locations across the screen and always have the same functionality. Once you have defined the colors you want, click the Save and Restart button at the bottom of the page. This will write the color definitions into the IoT stick and make them available for LED setup. Now we come to the main part of the page, the actual definition of each LED. Note that only LEDs that are defined in this part of the page will actually illuminate. LEDs that are not configured simply remain dark. First, let me explain the example configuration. 
After that, I will show you all other options that are available. First, we specify the position of the LED that we want to configure. This is done in the LED selector part to the left. In this case, we deal with LED number 0, which is the one on the blue headboard. If you are not sure about the LED number of a particular signal you want to program, you can try it by entering the LED number you think it should be and then click the hyperlink to the left of the number field. This will cause the selected LED to come on in white color for about 5 seconds. If it is the one you thought it would be, you have confirmation. If not, try a different number. The drop-down box below lets you select the input type. In the example it is set to dynamic signal. We will see in a minute what that means. The next field shows the switch addresses used to control the signal. Note that for switch addresses there is an offset of 1 compared to the switch addresses shown on your throttle. So addresses 0 and 1 as shown in the example refer to switch addresses 1 and 2 on your throttle. This offset goes back to the DCC standard, which defines the digital address 0 as switch number 1. But unfortunately the DCC standard is not consistent when it comes to signal addresses. There the signal address is identical with the technical address. Given the choice of having two different numbering systems or having switch addresses that have an offset of 1 compared to the DCC numbering scheme, I opted for consistency and always use the technical address, hence the offset of 1 when it comes to switch addresses. On the right side is the LED command sequence editor which is used to specify the colors and blink rates and so on. In our case of a dynamic signal with two addresses, the editor is pre-populated with four possible options and all we have to do is defining the colors for each option. It starts with the value for switch 0 thrown. In the on color drop-down we can choose the color of the LED when that switch command is received. The off color is selected if the LED is off while still reacting to switch number 0 thrown. This is the case when the LED is set to blinking. If nothing is set it just goes dark. If we set a color it blinks with on and off colors. The mode drop-down lets us define how the LED behaves when active. Static means it is just on. Local blink means the LED is blinking using an LED specific blink bit which gets triggered when the command is received and blinks with the peri period specified in the rate field. And it can blink in sync or opposite to the blink bit which is useful if you want to define an, altern an alternate blink light for example for a level crossing. Global blink is the same but it is using a system wide blink bit which means all LEDs using global blink will do so synchronized independent of the LED position in the chain and the time of activation. Ramp up and ramp down causes the LED to change the brightness of the LED as a triangle function either with positive or negative slope. And again it can be controlled by the local or global blink bit. The last option defines how changing colors is taking place. Direct changes from one color to the other in an instant. Soft causes the LED to ramp down on the old color and then ramp up on the new color. This is the typical searchlight signal behavior. If you set it to merge, it will gradually change to the new color while maintaining the brightness. See this example here on an HSV color chart. If the color is merged from one to another, it is simply changing the U angle, while the values for saturation and brightness remain constant. And it will always use the smaller angle to go to the next position. So if you change from red to green, it will merge through yellow. If you merge from red to blue, it will go through magenta. Now let's go back to the LED selector area and look at the remaining options. First, the number of LEDs is not limited to 1. 
In fact, you can specify as many as you want by just using a comma separated list of LED positions. As soon as you do that, you get the individual colors checkbox. If you leave it unchecked, the color settings on the right side will apply to all LEDs in the list. If you check it, you get an additional drop-down on the command sequence editor that lets you specify the color for each LED individually. And finally, use the drop-down box below to specify what command the LED should interpret. Let's have a closer look at those options. Block detector is straightforward. The LED is just following the status of the block detector specified in the first address of the address field. Additional addresses will be ignored. If the status is free, the on color of the first line is selected and occupied makes it choose the on color from the second line. Note that for most input types the number of option lines is set by the system. Switch causes the LED to listen to a single switch command. Here we have four different values as specified in the DCC standard. The position can be thrown or closed and the coil can be on or off. The four values represent the combination of these options. In most cases the coil on off option is not important as the coil is normally off and the activation time is short. So probably you will set the colors only based on the position and make it the same for coil on and coil off. DCC signal makes the LED respond to DCC signal commands. Here the number of lines is not defined by the system. The DCC signal command is defined for aspect values from 0 to 31, but typically you will not use all of them. So you have the option to define, let's say, four aspects and just define colors for those. On my layout I am using aspect values 0, 2, 5 and 10. So I am typically defining aspect values 0, 2, 5 and 31, with 31 being the catch-all value for aspect values greater than 5. If you want to use more aspects, you can simply add lines as needed, up to a maximum of 32. When setting the values, you should make sure they are all in ascending order, starting with the lowest value, normally 0, then going up. It is also a good idea to use the last position to define the maximum value, so that every possible aspect received will result in a valid LED setting. Remember that when an aspect value is received that does not have an entry in the command sequence, the system will automatically pick the next higher value. That's why I use 31 as catch-all value, and my maximum aspect value of 10 will automatically trigger it. Static signal and dynamic signal are used to drive signal aspects using switch commands. The difference is that dynamic signal just interprets the last received switch command on one of the listed addresses. Static signal, on the other hand, interprets the combination of the positions of all assigned switch addresses. You can see that by watching the value field. If we have two switch addresses for the signal and we set it to dynamic signal, we get four value entries. Zero thrown, zero closed, one thrown and one closed. This always refers to the last received command. If we set it to static, we also get four values, but now it is the combination of the two addresses. Zero thrown, one thrown, one closed, one thrown, zero thrown, one closed, and zero closed, one closed. Now we add a third address. In dynamic mode we will get six different values as we have possible six last commands. In static mode however we have now eight values as there are eight possible combinations. And if we add even a fourth address we would get eight and sixteen entries. The advantage of using dynamic signal addressing is that each aspect can be activated by just one switch command. But if you need more than four aspects per signal, it is using more switch addresses. Static signal, on the other hand, is more economic on switch addresses, but requires more commands to be sent. 
Also, when you have to send several commands to set one particular aspect, you may potentially see other aspects being displayed in the process. For this reason, I have added a 2 second delay for static signal mode before the LED display is updated. At least if the commands are coming from a computer, that should be sufficient to avoid displaying invalid aspects. Button lets you specify a command for each possible button status. Button up, down, button click, double click and button hold. Button commands are issued by button input modules such as the yellow hat which will feature 32 input buttons. It is currently in an advanced design state almost ready to have the first PCB version manufactured. So it certainly is a good idea to subscribe to the IOTT channel below and hit the bell icon so you will be in a premium seat when more information about the yellow hat becomes available. Analog input is the second category that does not give you a determined list of values as analog values can go from 0 to 4095. You can therefore add lines as needed, for example 0, 1000, 2000, 3000 and 4095. When an analog message comes in, the system will always choose the next higher defined value for LED display. So if you define a color value for 0 and one for 1000, an incoming analog value of 0 will trigger the first color. Everything greater than 0 up to 1000 will use the second line. There is one more option though in this case. If you change the color adjustment field from discrete to linear, the color values will be scaled as well. So if you define a value of 0 with color red and a value of 1000 with color green, you will see a gradual change of color for incoming analog values from 0 to 1000 according to the color wheel. So if a value of 500 comes in, you will get yellow as it is between red and green. Again, it will always use the shortest path between two specified colors. So you can easily define an LED showing the room temperature as color spectrum from blue to red. Pretty cool. Power status shows the layout power status using the values on, off and idle. These are the values you can set on the Digitrack throttles. Note that at this time it does not interpret the DCC idle command. We also will have to see what this command shows once open LCB becomes available as input source. The final option is steady on, which causes the LED just to be on or blink all the time. The address input is ignored in this case. Ok, that's it for the overview on configuration options of the Blue Hat. You see, it is a very simple module, but it offers quite some flexibility. I originally planned to include some real configuration examples with this video, but it is already now longer than intended, so I will probably make several short videos covering typical configurations and place them on the myiott.org website. Check the IOTT stick blue hat section for more information. And that's it for this video. I hope this information was useful or at least interesting for you. If so, you know what to do. Thanks for watching and see you next time.